Now, if you have your Bible, go ahead and take it and turn with me to the book of James. I'd like to ask you to open your scripture there. Um, you're going to see these five little chapters that are here. And this is somewhat of an important uh, moment because this is the close of our study that we have studied for um, over a year. We've been looking at the book of James. It comes after the book of Hebrews. It's almost in the back of your Bible, um, just as you're getting back before the book of Revelation. Five little chapters that are here. Now, what's kind of funny about this is that as we've been looking at missions emphasis from a few weeks ago, and then Sheridan Hills Heritage Week, we did that. We don't usually have these special emphases. And then we had Irma Week, which meant everybody stayed home and watched the wind blow. Um, and then came back after recovering from Irma. Um, many of us felt a little beat up and worn out. Um, and so last week we looked, does anybody remember what our text was last week? What book of the Bible was our text? Philippians, Philippians 4. Some of the most um, encouraging verses in all of the Bible. What to do uh, when you're under stress. What to do when you're in trouble. If you haven't watched it, I would encourage you to go and to watch the sermon from last week. If you missed it, my dad ends that message and it's on the video um, of dad rejoicing, mom dancing, even though part of their house was flooded and some difficulty that is there. Um, you know, if you ever get a little down, I want to encourage you to just go download that sermon, just go look at it and skip all the way to the end um, and just watch mom and dad and their joy. Um, some of you are wondering, what in the world are you talking about? Uh, you have to see it to believe it and it helps to know my mom and dad. Um, but you know, sometimes we just really, we really need encouragement. Now, I am really encouraged by the last two verses of this great book of the Bible. Um, in fact, uh, Pastor Lucas, while we were talking and, and, and meeting recently, he said, you know, Pastor, if you don't finish those last two verses of the book of James, I'm going to do it next time that I preach. So um, I took that as a threat. And um, this morning we come to the conclusion of this great study. Now, when you come to a conclusion, it's good, especially if we've been distracted by some other things, it's good for us to remember what we've been studying. And so this morning, allow this to pour over you a little bit, allow this to be a reminder of us, a reminder to us. I'm going to read the two verses, especially since they're so short, and then we're going to look at what we've learned from Pastor James as he was writing to the early churches. We'll, we'll go through that, and then we'll make three observations from these two verses. But James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, he ends the entire book abruptly. He ends it not like a normal letter. It's been more of a diatribe. It's a, a, a Greek um, uh, pontification and, in fact, rebuke um, to some degree, and that's kind of what the, the letter of James is like. But he ends it rather abruptly, not very personable, but I want you to see the amazing touch of grace by which James ends this letter of challenge. Look at James chapter 5 and verse 19. My, this is in the box on the page. My brothers, is if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, this letter has really pointed and cut down into our lives, pointed and cut down into our practices and into our hearts and caused us to really consider some things. It has been a bit of a rebuke to the reader. But here we see, while the book of James might be a, quite a stinging rebuke, to us in so many ways, it is done in love and it is done in grace. Because we remember that whom the Lord loves, he disciplines or he chastens. And so notice here 
that this really ends with this beautiful phrase. Look at the end of the phrase. It says, and will cover a multitude of sins. Put a little line out there to the side and write, a good thing, all caps, a good thing. You want your sin covered. If your sin is uncovered before God, that is not a good thing. In fact, the Bible gives the imagery that Christ covers us with his robe of righteousness. He covers our sin with himself. He covers our sin with his death on the cross so that we can be seen as righteous and not as the sinners of which our earthly, fleshly nature are in bondage. So Christ comes to come, he, he comes to cover us um, in our need. So it really ends in a beautiful picture of God's grace. Let's see, what are some things that we've learned from the book of James? This is so important, and I encourage you to just kind of look back over these five chapters and think through this. One of the first things that we see in the book of James that he is calling us to is that he's showing us that true faith, while in a fallen, sinful world, is always t tested, is always tested. At first, I had not left out the word while, and it was very awkward because it could be read as faith in a fallen sinful world will be tested. Well, we don't want to have faith in a fallen sinful world. We want to have faith, true faith, while in a fallen and sinful world. Does that make sense? So if we have true faith in Jesus Christ, if we have true faith in the covering of God's sacrifice of over our sins, if we have true faith in God, then it is going to be tested. In fact, faith that is not tested, is it really faith at all? Notice here with me, he, he makes this point at the very beginning of the book. Do you have your Bible open? We're going to see a couple of these. Look at James chapter 1. In verse 1, James chapter 1, in verse 1 is the opening where he names to the writer and so forth, and he says that I'm writing this out to the Jews that are, that are dispersed all over the Mediterranean world. That's what that means. But look where he begins. Do you remember this? Over a year ago, we looked at this. In verse 2, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, whenever everything goes swimmingly. Is that what it says? Look what it says in verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, whenever you meet what? Trials of various kinds or various kinds of trials. So he starts off by saying, your faith is going to be tested. He goes to the $64,000 question right out of the box. What about trouble? What about pain? What about difficulty? And James hits it head on for Christians. He says, in the world, you're going to have trouble. He recognizes it. And he says, even consider it joy when you go through these things because God is is at work. He doesn't act like there's not trouble. He doesn't act like I'm fine, you're fine, everybody's fine. Just act happy and maybe you'll be happy. I mean, that's not the picture when you come to the Bible. The Bible is talking in a very, very real sense that even though we may know God and even though we may be saved by God's grace, we still are experiencing troubles. This is life in a fallen world even for people who know God. And James hits it head on. So in chapter 1, we see it's many different kinds of trials. Fill that in if you haven't already. In chapter 5, we see that it's much, fill it in, suffering. You remember with me, that he got, at the beginning of chapter 5, he's talking about the fact that there's going to be, be, excuse me, in the mid part of verse 5, he's saying, be patient in the suffering. Be patient through the trouble. But notice the last bullet point there. All of the chapters show us that your faith is going to be tested through temptation to sin. 
There's going to be sin tendencies in your life. There's going to be sin tendencies even in the body of Christ around you. People are going to tend toward sin. You're going to be tempted to live in sin. And James is hitting all of those. Trials, suffering, sin. You are going to be tested. There's a second area that we see that we've gotten out of this this year-long study of James. And Lotus number two with me. True faith is proven when you live out, all caps maybe, when you live out what you say you believe. You see, it's very easy to say that you believe something, but it may be much more difficult to live it. I received a text from a pastor friend here in town, in fact, the pastor of First Baptist Church of Weston, Mark Tuso, yesterday, and it was a quote by Martin Lloyd-Jones, and the quote by Martin Lloyd-Jones basically says, hey, you know what? The hardest thing in the Christian life is prayer. The hardest thing for us very often is to to discipline ourselves, to come down before God and give to God our attention, give to God our trust, give to God our pray, give to God His praise in the midst of our troubles. Um, one of the most difficult things in the Christian life is prayer, but it is essential to our Christian victory. When we are prayerless, we become powerless. But when we come to God in prayer, when we live out what he has said, we experience his presence in our lives. Notice this, in faith without, in James chapter 1 verse 17, it very clearly says that faith without works is dead. If you're not living it out, do you really have faith? What about James chapter 1, verse 22? Read it out loud together with me. You see it right there underneath that in James 1, 22. What does it say? Be doers of the word and not... Well, you know, he wrote that because we have a tendency to be hearers only. Oh, yeah, that's right. Preacher nailed it today. Boy, that truth is so true. Well, do we do do it? It's possible for us to come here and even say amen and even take all the notes. Pastor Coleman, with all of the notes, it's possible to sit here and to do the notes, to be here. It's possible to even, maybe even give our, of our offerings and our tithes and to give sacrificially and yet still not obey as we've been called to obey. James is just confronting that. And notice he is saying, come live it out. The first bullet point there is, it shows in doing what is right. This is obedience. But not only does it show in doing what it's right, it, it, part of what he's saying is, don't just say it, do it. So fill both of those in. But it also shows not just in doing what is right, but it also shows in rejecting what is wrong. So you're called to do what is right and reject what is wrong, to not do, to repent of doing what is wrong. And this is sin. That is what James is hitting at. He's saying, do you do what you should do? Do you not do what you shouldn't do? And he is naming sins. Now remember with me, this is the first letter to the churches. This is the, the, all these people, these synagogues that were meeting all around the Mediterranean world in what is modern-day Turkey and Greece and all the way over to Rome, across North Africa, across Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, even Algeria. Churches had spread all across there, thousands of people meeting on a weekly basis, typically in Jewish synagogues. That's, that's where the gospel went first. And here they are, meeting together, claiming the name of Christ, and... James is confronting the idea that, yeah, you may be coming to synagogue, and you may be coming to synagogue that now has accepted Messiah as being Jesus Christ, Yeshua, but are you doing what he said? Because the Lord Jesus was very intent on that. Jesus said, many of you say, Lord, Lord, but you do not do the things that I say. In fact, the difference between the wheat and the tares are those who do what he says versus those who don't do what he says. 
Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he says in the other way, if you don't do what I said, you do not love me. So our action is intimately tied to our faith. And that's the point James has been making to us through these five chapters. He's been showing us, look, if you say it, do it. Um, Notice this. This is so important for us to see that faith alone saves. Do you know how this ends? Faith alone saves, but what? Faith that saves is never alone. Now, that's an important concept for us to get. That faith alone saves you. Your works will not save you from your sin. Your works will not save you from hell. You cannot overcome the evil that you've committed by doing good. In yourself that's not going to change your spiritual bank account before God but let me tell you what the picture is here it is faith in Christ is the only thing that will save us but if you have faith in Christ you're going to have works to go with it and I don't mean selective little works to prove a little checklist to yourself no the picture is you're gonna have a changed life you're going to start to live like Christ said to live. You're going to start to think like Christ said to think. You're going to increasingly say, I'm not going to live the way the world lives around me because it's fallen and sinful. Instead, I'm going to take on following Christ and getting ready for heaven. That is the picture of the Christian life. That is why we are here. That is why we are here not only this morning, but that is why the body of Christ is here in this age Working out our faith, working out our obedience in Christ, being prepared for heaven. You see, the last point that I have there under number two is that we obey not because we want to be saved, but we obey because what? We are saved. Now, religion which teaches, which would have cultural Christianity as part of it, would, would have Islam as part of it, would have um, Buddhism as part of it, would have many, many different types of things, including cultural Christianity, says ultimately that if you do all of the right things, your good is going to outweigh your bad, and God will let you in. I mean, somehow you're going to reach a place of nirvana, or you're going to reach a place of paradise, or you're going to reach a place of rest. Somehow you're not going to be condemned, so on and so forth. That is patently not what the Bible says. The Bible very clearly says there is one hope for the human condition in the human soul. And it's because that, and it is that God came to save us from ourselves. And if you put your trust in what he did, then you can know him. If you trust in anything else, you cannot know him. And you will die in your sins. You will be condemned in your sins. This is the gospel. It's radically different than religion. It's radically different than cultural Christianity. It's radically different than the thinking of the age. And so we see that true Christians obey not because they want to be saved, but they obey because they really are saved and they have been forgiven of their sins. Look at number three. We see this. And that that, that was big for James. He was saying that in chapter one very loud and very clear. Look at number three with me. James teaches us that in true faith, wisdom, wisdom, key issue, because this is wisdom literature, wisdom is promised and prescribed for daily life. You see, we need to know what God wants us to do. We need God's wisdom in order to even walk with him, in order to be who he's called us to be. And in James chapter 1, oh, we see that beautiful pr- promise, and it's one of the most prayed prayers in my life, which is, Lord, I need wisdom. I need wisdom, because, and you promise to give it. If I will ask in faith, believe, you promise to give it, because if you didn't do that, I wouldn't know how to come to you. 
And so if you'll just ask God for wisdom, he promises to give you wisdom. Ask him in faith, believing, and he promises. And then the rest of the book of James is talking about how to live in wisdom and how to make wise decisions, how to live with the right attitude and not be ruled by sin. So in the first part, the full, first bullet point you see there, it's ask for faith and, excuse me, ask for wisdom and faith. Um, don't doubt. Ask for wisdom and faith. And then we see also in James chapter 2, recognize God's wisdom versus the world's wisdom. Do you remember we talked about the fact that you might be streetwise? You might really know how the world works. But you know, the way the world works is not the way God works in the, in the eternity system. It's vastly different. In fact, the ways of the world are very often the opposite of the ways of God because we live in a fallen world. God says, you look on the outside, I look on the inside. God says, if you want to live, you got to die. Die to yourself. Live to Christ. Then you're going to really find life. Jesus came, the Savior of the world, not to crush death with all of his life, but he came to crush death first with his own death. He put to death, death, through his death on the cross and his resurrection over death. He comes. It's just the opposite of what we think. God designed nature to often represent this. Unless a seed dies, it cannot give new life. The seed dies, it goes into a completely different state, and then it comes back to life again to grow and to produce fruit. This is a wonderful picture of what God does with the human heart, that he comes, you die to self, and you live to Christ. Notice here with me the third bullet point under that. We see that wisdom, the key to wisdom, really is humility. In James chapter 4, we see that God exalts the humble, but he has nothing to do with the proud. So if you want to live the way God wants you to live, you must embrace the humility of God in your life. Uh, pride and prestige and power and pretense, all of that are poisonous, but humility is what brings life. Now, so one, two, and three, these are the things that, some of the, the key things that, that James is teaching us, but all along the way, throughout the entire letter, he says that true faith turns away from serious sins. Now, I'm hesitant to put the word serious there, because one sin can keep you from God, because God is a holy God and he accepts no sin. So, uh, the idea of serious sins as opposed to little sins. There are no little sins. Remi let me remind you that the nation of Israel was held up because of one man's sin in the bottom of his tent. You can go read about the, person, the story of Achan in the Old Testament. That He took some loot, he buries it in the bottom of his tent, and the whole nation of Israel is stopped because of this once. So, in a real sense, there are no little sins, but James is pounding out and bringing up to prominence some key sins, some sins that were perhaps very prevalent in that day and time and that we see are prevalent for us and that we can see that we see this kind of work that if this particular sin is not mentioned um, that we may be dealing with, we see the kinds of sins that he deals with. The first big one is that he mentions in, in um, the first big sin um, that he mentions is James chapter 1, verse 6, which is doubt or lack of faith. He says, ask for wisdom in faith. Ask for wisdom believing that God is going to give it. And he says, without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That man should not think that he would receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So James just starts out by slamming the sin of doubt. Whatever is not of belief, whatever is not of faith, is certainly of the world 
and of our sinful nature. We are called to believe in God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. With faith, all things are possible. It's amazing how the beauty of this is. So we see right away that God wants us, and James, he's saying he wants us to believe in him and to trust in him. What about this one? The sin of hearing but not doing. What can we call that? Disobedience. The sin of hearing but not doing. And we see it in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 4. That you know the right thing to do and don't do it, that is sin. How about the third bullet point there? Showing partiality to who? To the rich. This is a, this is a grave sin in the church. This, 2,000 years ago, James was hammering the church to say, don't exalt men based upon what they own or have. You treat everyone the same. And you can just go from whether it's how much money they have or how much education they have or how much prominence and power that they have or what the color of their skin is. You, you can take all of those things. That, what is the accent on their tongue? I mean, the picture is we are not to be partial. This is not of God. This is not the love of God. The Bible says that men from every tribe and every tongue and every nation are going to be gathered around the throne, lifting up holy hands and worshiping him. Jesus died for everybody, and he doesn't love some more than others in this picture. In the grand picture, his love is a love of his children, and he loves them freely. Notice the fourth point that is here. A fourth sin that is mentioned. An untamed tongue. Controlling what we say. And whether that has to do with profanity, or whether that has to do with gossip, or whether that has to do with, with self um, congratulation or whatever it may be, there's many different ways to sin with our tongue. And James really hammers that. And it, you, you see, the tongue can be so toxic to the church family. Um, pastor, pastor James is a pastor not only of the church of Jerusalem but to all of the churches and he knows that one of the real evidences of a saved person is that their tongue is not toxic. Now if you find someone that their tongue is continually toxic you may need to be talking to them about whether or not they know the Lord. Because you'd see the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. What's in your heart comes out of your mouth. And if your mouth, a lot of people, I've heard this before. I, I remember when I was in high school, I think I told you um, that we were up in Georgia and uh, a guy got kind of turned around that was driving and uh, he got mad. And I mean, he started cursing a blue streak. And there were two, I was a youth and my youth pastor was in the car from here in Sheridan Hills, and we're in the back seat, and so this man and his wife are in the front seat. He gets turned around. It's early in the morning. He's going the wrong way. Everything's kind of all messed up there at the airport, and he gets mad, and he just starts cursing, and the whole time his, his wife is sitting there going, he doesn't mean that. He doesn't mean that. That's not really that. He doesn't mean that. You know, she's just apologizing and apologizing and apologizing, and this guy just had an angry just venomous picture of, of just real hatred coming out of his mouth. And, um, you know, the, the sad thing was that Jesus said that the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. So do you have a problem with your tongue? Let me say to you that you don't just have a problem with your tongue, you have a problem with your heart. Do you have a problem lying about other people? Do you have a problem gossiping? You have a problem being negative all the time? You may need to say, Lord, let me submit that to you. You see, a Christian hears that, and a Christian turns to the Lord and responds. A Christian doesn't say, well, that's just the way I am. Love me or leave me. I mean, there's a lot of Christians that kind of act like that. They say, well, you just love me the way I am, please. 
And you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus spoke a lot about what we say, and James came along, and he really deals with it. You see, James is trying to help us evaluate whether or not we really know the Lord. How about this one? The fifth bullet point there is the loving the ways of the world as opposed to the ways of God. There are some people that just love strife. strife. They love sensuality. They love the things of the world. These, these are the kinds of things mentioned in James 4. He really hammers that. Do you love the ways of the world? Do you love the values of the world? Or do you love the truths of God? In James 4, we see him dealing with pride and self-reliance. You see, true Christians aren't filled with pride. True Christians aren't filled with self-independence and self Uh, reliance. True Christians are reliant upon the Lord. True Christians are dependent upon God and dependent upon one another. We just finished a great starting point session this morning. I love this starting point group that we have um, that is in there. Um, We've been through hurricanes. We've been through all this. This has been the hardest starting point to finish that we've ever had, and I think great things are coming out of it. They've been so faithful, and they're there And this morning, we really looked at the fact that in the church life, we are called to be a family together, to be dependent upon one another, to fight against the individualism that's prominent in America, in our culture, and say, no, we're called to be brothers and sisters together. We're called to have deep relationships with each other. That's the Sheridan Hills that we're trying to build. If you're not interested in having deep relationships in this church, you're probably not going to love Sheridan Hills over the long run. But if you're willing to enter in and you're willing to start to love one another and care for one another, pray for one another, support one another, get to know one another, let people help you, you help others. If you're starting to open up your mind and your heart, then you're starting to see what Christ has designed for the church. And so pride and self-reliance isn't interested in that, and James slams it in the early church. How about this, trusting in earthly treasure? James really comes after this issue of looking at your wealth and loving your wealth and trusting in your wealth, thinking that it's going to insulate you from the troubles and the difficulties. This is part of the reason Jesus said it's very, very difficult for wealthy people to come to faith. (laughs) The poor man already knows this world doesn't have all the solutions. This world is hurt. But you know what? There's enough nice stuff around that a wealthy person can be deceived into thinking, well, I'll just add Jesus on top of everything I have. Make it a little bit better. A little sweeter. Listen, James is saying you don't trust in earthly treasure. You trust in heavenly treasure You trust in the values of God. And then the last one that he really comes after is, he says, there is hell to pay for taking advantage of the poor. I mean, go read those passages. He's saying that is a very serious thing, and their voices are crying out against you. You see, James comes after us very hard about whether or not we are true Christians and whether or not we are living it. Now, he ends all of this challenge with a call for us to realize three things, three key possibilities in James's conclusion, and we see this. Number one, it is possible to wander from the truth and to die in your sin. You say, well, pastor, that doesn't sound very encouraging to, to end with. Yeah, but that's not the complete end. Um, that's here. Um, There's a couple other points that are here. But we need to recognize that these verses show us it's possible to die in your sin. Look at verse 19 in the box at the top of the page. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, I mean, there it is right there. If anyone among you wanders from the truth, you can wander away from the truth. We see this in the book of Hebrews. We see this in the book of 1 John. We see Jesus speaking of this. We, listen to this. We see whole crowds that would come and follow Jesus. And it said, and many believed in him. But John is using the word believe in, in, in this way that some are saying, well, they believe that he did these things. 
but that they believe he was the Messiah. And we see that many came, saw, heard what he said, liked the free meals, but then they would stop following him. They would leave him. It says many were turning away. In fact, so many were turning away at one point that Jesus just looked at his 12 disciples and says, hey, are you guys going to leave too? And what did Peter say? Peter said, where would we go? You have the words of life. You see, Peter got it. And even though Peter got it, he still struggled. And he, did he do everything perfectly? No. When it came time to die, Peter curses and denies that he even knows the Lord. You see, we need to recognize that we can wander away from the truth. Judas was around the truth the whole time, and he wandered away from the truth, and he died in his sin. Peter was around the truth all the time. He wandered away, and he kept coming back. He wandered away, and he kept coming back. And, you know, who knows? Andrew and the others that were there with him were perhaps going to him. Peter, it's okay, man. It's okay. Don't, don't flip out here. I mean, you know, the, he was part of the community that kept coming back. Now, we need to recognize that, it, that there are many, in many places in the Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, where we see that people come, see, hear all of the power, all of the glory, and all of the things that God is doing, and yet say, thanks, but no thanks. I love the world more. Look at 1 John chapter 2. This is so important for us to see. I've printed out this longer passage because I want you to see it. And the word antichrist is used here. It's antichrist is the idea of those who, who knew Christ, but yet the big picture is, and it says it right here in the text, those who don't believe in Christ as son of God. Those who ultimately come back and deny the Lord with their lives. So look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, and this is the last hour that we're in now. Someone said to me, Pastor, I was watching the news this week, and I feel like this is the end. And I'm like, yeah, we've been in the end for 2,000 years. I mean, seriously. Now, there is an end to the end, Matthew 24, that gets pretty tough. And who knows? It may, that, that may be where we are. I don't know. But if so, I say, Maranatha, Lord, come. Christians have no, true Christians do not need to be ashamed at his appearing. Amen. True Christians can rejoice at his appearing. True Christians have read the end of the book and said, oh, it's going to get tough, but then it's going to really get great. You see, true Christians don't have to be afraid of the end of the end times. True Christians can truly rejoice in the end of the end times, and we do that by faith, trusting in what he said. But, but there are some who leave the Lord. There are some who go away from the gospel. Notice what it says. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Not the Antichrist, but the, a, a spirit of anti, a spirit of unbelief is coming. So now many Antichrists, you see there's the picture, many have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. Verse 19, they went out from us, underline this, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, then they would have continued with us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge and you all have knowledge. Verse 21. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Verse 22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is? is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. What does that mean? Jesus is the anointed one. Jesus is the chosen one to take away the sins of the world. Jesus is the only one who can die for sins. And who is he? He's the second person of the Trinity. He's God. This is the amazing gospel that God comes and pays for our sins. A glorious picture of his grace. So that those who deny that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who pays... Middle of verse 22, this is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. Verse 23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide, that means remain. Let it remain in you. 
if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, it stays with you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he, that he made to us, eternal life. Shouldn't be, have an E after that, sorry. That he made to us eternal life. Now here is the picture. You have Christ, it, it, and it, it is proven if you stay with him, but if you leave him, it proves that you did not have him from the beginning. So let, let me tell you that it's passages like this that make me say, wow, uh, I, I want to be careful to stay with the Lord. And you see, it's that very attitude that is an evidence of my salvation. And if I run away from the Lord and deny Christ, you can, you can say, Pastor Andrew must not have never really been a Christian if he runs away from the Lord, denies the Lord, and dies in his sin. You can say, well, it sounded good. Seems like he understood the gospel, but he must not have been a Christian because of 1 John chapter 2. Billy Graham had a dear friend that was, in a, was a, a great intellectual thinker and preacher that was coming along in the 1950s, right when Billy Graham was rising to prominence. And that friend wound up becoming apostate. That friend wound up denying Christ and walking away from the whole thing. And I remember as I read the account of the heartbreak of Billy Graham, that how much that affected him in his heart, and how it shook him, that this man who seemed to understand the gospel so very clearly, and, and it was 1 John chapter 2 that just began to, real, to begin to reveal that his heart had never been regenerated from a life of sin into a life of forgiveness in Christ. And he never turned back to the Lord. Um, look at number two. It's not only possible to die in your sin, but this is wonderful, and here's where the grace begins. Verse 2, it is possible to wander from the truth and be brought back to redemption. So the, the truth is there. You hear the truth. That's what James is talking about, the truth. But has the truth redeemed you? If you were with the truth and then you leave, well, that's, that's not good evidence that you would receive the truth. But if you come back to the truth, this is evidence that you are part of the redemption of God. Look at verse 19. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner... And the word sinner is often used in the New Testament. That, that word is used for an unregenerate person, someone who does not know God. Not just in general that we're all sinners saved by grace, but this is a sinner that's not been saved. So let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So part of the picture is here, you may have heard the truth, seemed that you understood it or seemed that you knew it, but you left it, but you wind up coming back, and in your coming back, perhaps that is the moment of salvation. Perhaps that is the time of your sin being covered in Christ. Now, this is an important concept to us, and I, I've just... I've not given you any blanks here. I want you to see these statements. Perhaps you have felt overwhelmed by the judgment of James's letter. Perhaps you in this room have felt that way. There's been particular things that have caused you to really wonder. Look at the next one there. Perhaps your sin has become more evident to you now than ever before. It caused you to wonder, am I, have I really been redeemed? Perhaps this message this morning is your warning and call to repentance from sin and to embrace God's grace in your life. If that is true, these verses are being lived out. Don't delay. Run to Him today. What else would you wait for? As Job prayed, this may be your last stop. That's not manipulative. I, I'm not trying to be dramatic in saying that. Whether it's by death that you do not have another opportunity 
or whether it's by the voice of the Holy Spirit calling you to himself, I want to encourage you to hear his voice and respond to him. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Allow his voice to call you to himself. Simply respond in joy and recognize what he has done. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 20 and 21. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. The law was given to us to show us and to reveal to us our trespasses. But where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, the picture is this, that sure, we're going to have sin and we're going to wander, but do we run to the Lord? Is that what our picture is of who we are and what we've done, His work in us? This is His grace calling us to Himself. And those who hear His voice, they're going to respond. Those who hear His voice and have light to believe, they're going to believe. I want to encourage you today to say yes to that. Well, look at number three. This is kind of amazing. and In fact, I, I'm just amazed by this really every single week of my life. Look at number three. It is possible to be used by God in his saving work in other people's lives. We see this from these two verses. It's possible to be used by God in his saving work in other people's lives. Look up there at those verses. Look at verse 19 and 20 again. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, there it is, someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is God working through other people. This is God. It's not that Jose is going to save his co-worker that comes to Christ. Jose didn't save his co-worker that he leads to Christ. But God uses Jose that the work of Christ can come to his co-worker. Every now and then in zeal, a new Christian will say that maybe prayed to receive Christ with me or something along those lines that, that I led them to the Lord. Every now and then, some, one of them will say, well, you know, Pastor, when you saved me last year, da 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 and that always sends just this great electric shock down my spine because I didn't save anyone. There is only one who can save. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. But God uses faithful, obedient people to bring the gospel to other people that they may be saved. Now, I, I just I can't tell you anything that is more beautiful, a more beautiful picture that God would not only come and save us with his own blood, but that he would use sinners that he has saved in his eternal purposes. That is amazing grace. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to be a Christian, but you know, there's something that's even more wonderful than that. To be a Christian whom God uses. That is awesome. And I mean, I don't think that you've really lived until God begins to use you. That's a greater thrill than flying an F-14 Tomcat at 1,500 miles an hour. And that's all I wanted to do for most of my life when I was a kid. But you know what? When, when I started to see that God wants to use me and all of my hang-ups and all of my trouble in the lives of other people, that became somehow more desirable than flying a Tomcat. Some of you are wondering what a Tomcat is. Sorry. Um, Whatever your greatest thrill is, let me tell you that there's no greater thrill than the eternal creator of the universe breathing life through you to somebody else. He does that as we are simply faithful to obey. James 5.15, Galatians 6.1, Matthew chapter 18.15, Proverbs 13 or 11.30 says, 
he who wins souls is wise. Um, but look at Malachi chapter 2 and verse 6, and this is speaking of Levi. I love this. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and upright, uprightness, and look at the last, underline it, and he turned many from iniquity. You see, that is a priestly act. That is a priestly position that God is so gracious that he will even use sinners like you and me who have been saved by his grace in the lives of others. He's, he's wanting to use you. He's given you instructions to go and tell the gospel to the people around you, to go live in such a way and share the truth in such a way that other people would know what is the hope that's within you. And so he's saying, I want to use you. And he's calling some of you to step that up and to say, Lord, I want to be used of you. I want to be used of you to turn people back. I don't want to sit there and encourage, you see, how dreadful would it be if a Christian just encourages someone in their wandering from the truth? You go enter into gossip that's poisoned somebody in the life of the church, and you just kind of go, yeah, I know what you mean. I feel the same way. <gasps> you, you may be contributing to that person leaving the truth and staying away from the truth, as opposed to saying, no, wait, 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 wait. Don't wander away. Wait a minute, come back. We, we, let's work through this. Let, let's, let's figure this out. Let's call one another to not leave the Lord, to stay in the truth. You see, fill this in. Perhaps there is no greater grace or joy than to be used by God for eternal purposes. Perhaps there is no greater grace or joy than to be used by God. You say, well, what about the forgiveness of my sins? Well, that is assumed. Your salvation would be assumed. You say, well, that, that, that's glorious and that's wonderful. But what's so amazing is that, listen to this, the Bible describes it as that we come and we bring to the Lord treasures. And we bring to the Lord treasures as we bring people to him. As we are proclaiming the gospel to the world around us. You know, as, as good reform people, we can become so reform minded in many of these things that we forget God's call to be obedient in being useful to Him and used of Him to preach the gospel. We must be very careful about that. That we see it is His sovereign plan to use our mouths to their ears that they would know the gospel and respond to the gospel. Because, as you see at the bottom there, there's, there's often no greater joy than this, and I would say that in, in light of this great poem. Only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. These days are going to be quick. And we have the opportunity, as Jesus said, to lay up our treasures in heaven instead of laying up our treasures on earth. And that's what James is encouraging us to.